Scarlet Ibis by James Hurst, part one. It was in the clove of seasons. Summer was dead, but autumn had yet, not yet been born, that the ibis lit in the bleeding tree. The flower garden was stained with rotting brown magnolia petals, and iron weeds grew rank amid the purple flocks. The five o'clock by the chimney still marked time, but the oriole nest in the elm was untenanted and rocked back and forth like an empty cradle. The last graveyard flowers were blooming, and their smell drifted across the cotton field and through every room of our house speaking softly the names of our dead. It's strange that all this is still so unclear to me, that the summer has long since fled and time has had its way. A grindstone stands where the bleeding tree stood, just outside the kitchen door. And now, if an oriole sings in the elm, its song seems to die up in the leaves, a silvery dust. The flower garden is prim, the house a gleaming white, and the pale fence across the yards stands straight and spruce. But sometimes, like right now, as I sit in the cool green draped parlor, the grindstone begins to turn, and time, with all its changes, is ground away, and I remember Doodle. Doodle was just about the craziest brother a boy ever had. Of course, he wasn't a crazy, crazy like old Miss Leedy, who was in love with President Wilson and wrote him a letter every day. But was a nice crazy, like someone you meet in your dreams. He was born when I was six and was, from the outset, a disappointment. He seemed all head with a tiny body, which was red and shriveled like an old man's. Everybody thought he was going to die. Everybody except Aunt Nicey, who delivered him. She said he would live because he was born in a call, and calls were made from Jesus' nightgown. Daddy had Mr. Heat, the carpenter, build a little mahogany coffin for him, but he didn't die. And when he was three months old, Mom and Daddy decided they might as well name him. They named him William Armstrong, which was like tying a big tail on a small kite. Such a name sounds good only on a tombstone. I thought myself pretty smart. At many things, like holding my breath, running, jumping, or climbing the vines in Old Woman Swamp. And I wanted more than anything else, someone to race to Horsehead Landing, someone to box with, and someone to perch with in the top fork of the great pine behind the barn, where across the fields and swamps you could see the sea. I wanted a brother, but Mama crying told me that even if William Armstrong lived, he would never do these things with me. He might not, she sobbed, even be all there. He might as long as he lived lie on the rubber sheet in the center of the bed in the front bedroom where the white marquisite curtains billowed out in the afternoon sea breeze, rustling like palmetto fronds. It was bad enough having an invalid brother, but having one who possibly was not all there was unbearable, so I began to make plans to kill him by smothering him with a pillow. However, one afternoon as I watched him, my head poked between the iron posts at the foot of the bed. He looked straight at me and grinned. I skipped through the rooms, down the outgoing halls, shouting, Mama, he smiled. He is all there. He's all there. And he was. When he was two, if he laid him on his stomach, he began to try to move himself, straining terribly. The doctor said that this was, that with his weak heart, that this strain would probably kill him. But it didn't. Trembling, he pushed himself up, turning first red, then a soft purple, and finally collapsed back onto the bed like an old worn-out doll. I can still see Mama watching her, him. Her hand pressed tight across her mouth, her eyes wide and unbleaking, but he learned to crawl. It was his third winter, and we brought him out of the front bedroom, putting him on the rug before the fireplace. For the first time, he became one of us. As long as he lay all the time in bed, we called him William Armstrong, even though it was formal and sounded as if we were referring to one of our ancestors. But with this creeping around on the deerskin rug and beginning to talk, something had to be done about his name. It was I who renamed him. When he crawled, he crawled backwards, as if he were in reverse and couldn't change gears. If you called him, he'd turn around as if he were going to in the other direction, and he'd back right up to you to be picked up. Crawling backward made him look like a doodle bug, so I began to call him Doodle. And in time, even Mama and Daddy thought it was better than the name William Armstrong. Only Aunt Nicey disagreed. She said call babies should be treated with special respect since they might turn out to be saints. 
Renaming my brother was perhaps the kindest thing I ever did for him, because nobody expects much from someone called Doodle. Although Doodle learned to crawl, he showed no signs of walking, but he wasn't idle. He talked so much that we all quit listening to what he said. It was about this time that Daddy built him a go-kart, and I had to pull him around. At first, I just paraded him up and down the piazza, but then he started crying to be taken out into the yard, and ended up by my having to lug him around wherever I went. If I so much as picked up my cat, he started crying to go with me. And Mama could call from wherever she was, take Doodle with you. This is the end of... Scarlet Ibis Part 1.